Welcome to Big Shoulders, the show where we explore the civic technology space in Chicago. You know, if there was ever a list of essential reads in the civic technology space, Responsive City would be at the very top. Uh, the book, one of the central themes of this book is how the adoption of technology by both citizens and government has really forever changed the relationship between the two. It was co-written by Stephen Goldsmith, who is with us here today, along with Susan Crawford. And uh, Stephen speaks with a lot of authority on this topic because he's first of all a professor at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, where he's also the director of the Innovations in Government program. Prior to that, Steve, you were the deputy mayor of, Chicago, of uh, New York and a two-term mayor of Indianapolis, which is the 12th largest city in the nation. So welcome to Big Shoulders. Nice to be here, thank you. It's great to have you. Stephen, you obviously come with the highest levels of credibility in this space. Uh, to talk about the relationship between government and uh, citizens. So how has technology changed that relationship? Well, you know, the uh, average or historical relationship between government and citizens is that government does its own thing until the citizens march on City Hall and demand attention, right? Or uh, a bureaucrat, not even in the pejorative sense, decides what's in the best interest of a community and goes to, and tells, goes to a community meeting where people yell at the bureaucrat for an hour, then he, he or she goes back and does what they were going to do anyway, right? So, right? so technology, the question is, how can, how can more people, how can the average person, how can a broader array of people influence public policy and the delivery of public services? How can the public sector listen with different tools? What does social media mean to that conversation and that discourse? And, and coupled with the open data movement and social media mining tools and big data and handheld devices, the world has totally changed for the definition and relationship between the average civic individual and his or her government. And, and re related to that, in the book you frame the civic technology movement uh, in terms of its impact on the democratic process itself. How, what is the opportunity here for improving democracy through technology, especially at the local levels? Well, there's a couple ways to think about this. One is that you know, we often worry appropriately that you know, technology has kind of an upper learning, leaning uh, trajectory, right? So that folks in uh, professional communities and the like are disproportionately connected, which is true. But we've been thinking about it in a different way. What, what if government intentionally reaches out to underserved communities? What if advocates in those communities use social media tools to get the attention of government? How do we use technology actually to give voice to those who are voiceless? How does the, the pervasiveness of the smartphones and ubiquity of cell phones generally allow the organizing of information in those communities as well? So well, it, democracy depends on confidence that your democratic government will produce the services that are responsive to you. So technology allows those services to be personalized, Technology allows those services to be improved, and technology allows community and citizen groups to engage in the decision-making of priorities and decisions with their government. That's interesting because you, you, sometimes you hear the dynamic that technology is being is further stratifying the haves and the have-nots, and then you hear the uh, the argument that's quite the opposite, that technology has the opportunity to democratize and bring more people into that democratic process. So that's very interesting. Y you m talk quite a bit in your book about uh, data. What is the role that data has in this? Well, data it has kind of two sides to it as well. So one side of data, right, big data and predictive analytics, the work we started in New York, the work that Chicago is a leader at probably in the U.S. today, which is how do you look at data in multiple agencies and figure out where they're going to be rat problems? How are you going to figure out where, where the next building is going to burn down from multiple data sets that will do predictability with respect to kind of dangerousness, right? So, so that big data and predictive analytics is a huge change in the way government operates. So it can identify the outliers. It can stop a problem before it occurs rather than figure out how fast you respond after it occurs. The problem and restriction with that, though, is we don't want the definition of a responsive government to be the way that professional bureaucrats use big data to decide what's in a community's best interest. So we, that needs to intersect with the social media, right? The conversation, the priority setting in the community. So when the social media from the community and the big data from the enterprise come together, that's the definition of public value. And, and you touched a little bit about um, how 
technology has changed the actual work of the government worker itself. It's changed certainly the relationship between uh, citizen and government, but within government itself, civic technology has changed things. What is one of your favorite examples right. of that? So you know this whole idea of red tape is when, when a person behind the counter in a, in a in city hall asks you a question that's ridiculous and totally un, un, irrelevant to what you're trying to accomplish, right? But the, the bureaucrat goes, look, I'm supposed to ask these questions, so just get off my back. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, right? So we've created these rule-driven systems where public officials, public employees do these activities that don't necessarily produce an outcome. So, so now what we have is the ability of a public employee to use his or her discretion. Boston apps, right? So the public worker in Boston sees the picture of the pothole from the resident, can, has the authority to stop if they drive over a pothole to get to the pothole they're supposed to fix, can take a picture and send a copy of that pothole to the resident who made the complaint, right? So now we have you know, retail government where the public employee has knowledge, can use it under discretion, can solve a problem, and can connect that to the person who asked about it. And, and that speaks to the uh, building trust, right? Because once a citizen knows that, it, to use your example, that that pothole is being fixed and they're getting communication on the status of that, that builds trust. And that's another Right, because one of the areas of distrust, right, is that it's not just that, that it takes four days to fill the pothole. So I have no idea what you guys are doing. I made a sure. complaint and I don't see anything happening. So if you can fix expectations, if you can track the trajectory of the work, and if the person who has actually done the work can have a attaboy from the resident who, well, thanks for fixing that, right? That creates trust and reinforcement, public value, and almost a virtual cycle. Now, one of the things that I love about the response of City is that you use Chicago as an example a number of times. What is it about Chicago that makes it such a great civic tech yeah. story? Well, the Chicago, I mean, we've studied cases all over the country and, and so, to some extent around the world, and Chicago really does stand out. It stands out because the mayor had a commitment. It stands out because the CIO leadership uh, in the city, Brenna Berman today and her predecessors, have been extraordinarily talented. It stands out because the Chicago uh, Trust, Community Trust, and MacArthur have funded neighborhood organizations like Smart Chicago to act as intermediaries. And, and it also has won a Bloomberg grant for innovation as well. So it's got uh, executive leadership, it's got high quality employees, it's got a community uh, intermediary, if you will, that is doing a nice job of connecting the communities to City Hall. It's got all the ingredients for a really extraordinary success. That's great, and, and that's, uh, that's terrific that, the, that this whole ethos of civic tech, the whole movement, um, is really flourishing in Chicago uh, beyond that. So what's next in terms of civic technology? What can cities like Chicago that have adopted this movement, where are we gonna go next? What, what's the opportunity for us? Well, I think there's a couple ways to think about the next step. One is that there's no reason why we can't have a personalized relationship between residents of Chicago and their city or any other city, right? Why can't you register? Why do you have to call 311 to find out the answer to a question? Why can't you register and say, here's the areas I care about, here's the where I live, here's where I drive. I wanna to register to know when my parks department softball uh, court is available, right? Or when, when there's gonna be a pothole or a construction crew. So the personalization of that information, that's one way. Another way to do it, and I think this is the hardest one, is that we've created this, uh, these governments that are totally rule driven, irrespective of whether the rules make any sense. How we hire, how we fire, how we assign work, uh, how we look across the verticals of government, right? So we need the civic hackers and the civic work, and we need the government to change the way it listens to the civic community. So technical tools are all there, the listening's just not quite caught up. And you, you, you talk about that in Responsive City in the context of procurement, which is probably a, one of the best examples of that. What can cities who have not yet seen their civic tech movements take off, or their open data movements take off, what advice do you have for them to how to accelerate it? Right, well, so I think that the uh, fact that the uh, open data, you know, the originally the open data movement was a check the box uh, movement for accountability, right? Do you have open data or not? Okay, we have open data. It's ugly and unusable, and, but it's open, right? And now the definition of open data is data that's open and available and usable to, you know, and the APIs make sense and, and the app community can kind of build values. So they, can, they can study the allocation of public services. They can create feedback loops. They can, they can study uh, various other aspects of kind of how government delivers its services. And so I think what we can say is the, the higher and better your commitment to open data, 
the more you have hackathons and reach out to develop the civic community. You know, Chicago is extraordinary because that civic app community is really a great community and highly engaged. And you have a city that's highly engaged, and you have an intermediary that's highly engaged, and you have an open data platform. Those are the ingredients. That's what another city should follow. So open data, engaged city, engaged citizens. We've been talking with Stephen Goldsmith, co-author of The Responsive City, Harvard professor. Steve, thank you for coming. Thank you very much.